Excellent. Okay, so hopefully uh, on Friday, please, 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 please. Come on, guys. So hopefully uh, last Friday you got the gist of uh, what uh, dynamic programming is uh, about. Uh, and because students find uh, dynamic programming quite tricky, and in fact it's a, a tricky technique, I did not want to immediately also give you proofs that the solutions are correct, right? So, <coughs> excuse me, what we want to do now is uh, is uh, revisit the same examples and uh, also provide justification uh, for the correctness of uh, um, the solution, right? So first example that we saw is uh, uh, the example with uh, uh, ac activity selection, right? Uh, you have a collection of activities, A1 up to AN, and uh, you want to select a uh, subset of these activities that are non-conflicting, which means uh, uh, next activity st can start only after the previous activity finished, right? And that is of uh, longest total duration time, right? So not the largest number of activities as we solved uh, with Greedy, but this time it's uh, the largest total duration time. So uh, we can order these activities according to the finishing time into a non-decreasing sequence and uh, we can re-enumerate the activities uh, so that we can assume that uh, the finishing time of activity F1 is before the finishing time of activity F2 and uh, so forth up to activity Fn. So, um, guys, no talking, please, because you are disturbing others. Um, so what we are going to do, as we mentioned last time, the essence of dynamic programming is that essentially we generalize the, prog the problem and solve uh, uh, lots of sub-problems, but which are chosen in such a way that uh, they allow easy recursion, right? Because dynamic programming is essentially a recursive uh, procedure, right? So sub-problem PI will be find a subsequence sigma i of the sequence of activities that are obtained just by truncating the uh, whole sequence up to first i activities. So the sequence is a1 up to a i. And we wanted to satisfy the following condition that the activities are non-overlapping, that uh, the solution has to end with the activity AI, so with the very last activity of the sequence, uh, right? So, uh, and of course it is of maximal total duration among all subsequences that satisfy the conditions uh, one and two. And uh, um, so as we mentioned last time, uh, the co second condition is uh, uh, just to allow simpler uh, recursion. Okay, so let's denote by Ti the total duration of the optimal solution sigma i of the sub-problem Pi. Uh, how do we start the recursion? Well, if you have just one activity, then obviously obvious solution, and the only solution is to choose just A1. So the total duration uh, for of the solution of, for the case uh, i equals to 1 is just f1 minus s1. And then uh, we proceed by recursion. So we say, uh, you see, so when you do dynamic programming, uh, you build a table of solutions so that uh, um, you can, that is ordered, structured in such a way uh, 
that a solution for a sub-problem uh, can be built from optimal solutions for smaller size sub-problem that appear in this table before that uh, the, the solution for problem I, okay? So here um, uh, we will put in the table uh, just the total uh, duration of uh, the uh, optimal solution and we define it as uh, the following max. So it's the largest possible of these quantities Ti plus Fi minus Si so that Fi uh, ends before S, uh, sorry, that Fj ends before Si started. So you can see it here on the uh, picture, if uh, we are now solving the problem for the initial sequence of activities A1 up to AI, then we look for all activities that do, do not overlap with the very last activity. For each of these activities, we already have in the table, right? Because uh, FK is certainly smaller than FI because we order the activities according to the finishing time, right? So optimal solution for FK, then optimal solution for FK minus one, FK minus two, and so forth, is already present in the table because we fill the table in stages, right? Um, and you pick, you look at the optimal solutions for these uh, um, sub-problems, you pick one that has the largest total duration among all of the um, solutions for uh, these uh, uh, sub-problems, and you simply add the duration of this activity uh, Fi, right? So simply, you extend optimal solution of one of the optimal solution for uh, these previous activities by simply adding, choosing one of the longest duration and adding the length of activity Fi. Um, so, and of course in the table besides the I, Ti, sorry, the total duration of the activities, uh, optimal uh, activities, uh, we also store which J was um, extended, what solution for what J was extended. For example, if it was uh, K minus one, so then uh, K minus one will be stored together with F, uh, sorry, we, together with T K minus one. So um, now what we didn't do last time is uh, explain why such a recursion produce, uh, uh, produces uh, um, optimal solution to subproblem uh, PI. And the argument is essentially the same as the argument that we did for greedy, which is the cut and paste argument. So you simply say, so let the optimal solution of subproblem PI be this sequence, uh, AK1, AK2, all the way to AKM, where the very last, right, is KM is equal to I, because this is the sub-problem that we are solving. So now what we do is we truncate this sequence uh, uh, to the first um, M minus one elements. So you consider uh, the exactly the same sequence except without the very last activity. And the claim is that this must be optimal solution to the problem of finding maximal duration selection of uh, activities that end with the problem Km minus one, right? So what do you think, why is this so? So this is uh, the situation. This is the timeline and you have your activities and uh, say the optimal activity for that ends with the activity I, right? So it starts here as I finishes Fi. Assume 
that this, uh, that, uh, this particular K, uh, so S, this will be activity K that starts at SK and finishes at FK. So our optimal solution is this activity, this activity, and some past activities, uh, right? Now, what we are claiming is if I delete the very last activity, then what I am left with is optimal solution for the Kate problem, right? So if I have an optimal solution, so the longest total duration of non-conflicting activities that end with activity I, and if the previous activity of this optimal solution is the Kate activity, I am claiming that if I delete this activity, the remaining subsequence uh, is the optimal uh, solution for the problem PK, namely its optimal s solution, um, uh, it's the longest duration selection of activities uh, that are non-conflicting and end with the activity K. Why do you think this is the case? Uh? Why does this has to be have to be optimal solution for the problem PK? Yeah? But maybe there is something else unrelated to the choice here that actually produces a better solution up to K. Why is this impossible? Cut and paste. You see, if this was not the optimal solution, but something else was optimal solution that ends with K, that something else can be extended with the last activity and get a better solution for the, acti for the problem PI, right? Because what is the solution for PI? It's the length, total length of these activities plus that activity. Now, if there were something better, right, that uh, uh, say this, that ends also with this activity, I could remove this part, replace it with the optimal solution for SK, add I, and because this is longer than that, adding the same quantity will produce a better solution for I, and that's a contradiction. Do you understand that? Right, so we are looking for optimal solution up to activity I and arguing if we delete the last activity, what is left is the optimal solution that ends with the previous activity to activity I in the optimal solution, namely the Kate activity. Why is this so? If this wasn't optimal, but there was something better, you could take this something better, extend it with I, and get better solution than our alleged optimal solution. So this shows, this is sometimes called the optimal solution um, uh, property, right? That uh, um, optimal solution for the stage of recursion I is necessarily obtained from an optimal solution uh, of some previous stage. It cannot come from some suboptimal solution being extended. So this means that in your table, you can keep track only of optimal solutions and do recursion only on them, right? So that's really crucial uh, feature and uh, one of the uh, 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 traps in dynamic programming is that actually sometimes it looks as this sub problem, sub optimality of sub problems is satisfied when actually it is not, as we will see later when we cover more uh, examples. So this shows that uh, um, uh, in fact uh, the solution, oops, uh, it shows that in fact. Uh, a uh, solution for I can be chosen by finding the best possible solution for sub-problems 
that end uh, with an activity prior with the activity i, non-conflicting with activity i, and just extending this optimal solution by choosing the one that has largest total duration, right? So this is pretty tricky stuff. I would urge you to read carefully the slides and with paper and pencil and try to reconstruct, uh, read the proof and then try to redo it yourself uh, just to see that you understand each step uh, correctly. And as I say, it's, uh, um, it, is, it, it is tricky in the beginning, but eventually you get the gist because we will uh, do lots of problems of uh, this type, dynamic programming. Okay, so once we solved all the problems pi for i smaller or equal than n, we are still not done. Because you remember the solution of the problem i requires uh, constraints that it has to end with the activity i. So the solution for the very last end problem also has to end with the end activity, but it is not necessary, of course, that the optimal, global optimal solution involves activity a n. So what we do, we then do another scan, you see, we go through our table, look at the lengths of all optimal solutions, right? And uh, we pick one that is the longest, the longest of them. And of course, you remember, we also record besides ti, the activity um, uh, j so that uh, pi extends the optimal solution of the problem pj. So for example, here in the table, in the i-th slot of the table, as you feel it, uh, here you will put t of i, and you will put here, I, on the board I used k, which tells you what activity is extended. Why is this so? Because then you can backtrack. You can look at t of k, and see what activity is extended and so forth. Going backwards, you can reconstruct uh, the sequence uh, of the activities that are involved in the optimal solution. You don't have to store the entire optimal solution in this cell simply because if you just put a pointer which activity is being extended, uh, you can backtrack and uh, reconstruct the solution. Okay, so let's see um, the longest increasing subsequence once again. Um, for those of you that are comfortable with dynamic programming, I hope you are not too bored because uh, in my experience it really, uh, understanding for the majority of uh, students who haven't had experience with uh, dynamic programming, uh, this is pretty tricky business. So assume that you have a sequence of numbers, uh, right, say n1, n2, uh, let's see, maybe I could keep, uh, well, say, not number, uh, say a1, a2, up to an, and we want to solve the following problem. We want to find the longest possible subsequence of this sequence, which is strictly increasing, uh, right? How do we do that? Uh, again, we solve the problem of finding the longest strictly increasing sequence, but such that it ends uh, with the activity, uh, that ends with the activity AI, right? So we enforce, so notice we are looking for not just the longest increasing sequence, subsequence, but the longest increasing subsequence which ends the very last activity AI, because again, this allows easy recursion. And as we will see, it's non-restricting. How do we do that? Well, which sequences can be extended by the activity AI? Clearly, uh, for that, we would only sequence is ending with some AM, so that AM is smaller than AI, right? Then an increasing sequence that's, that ends with AM 
can be uh, extended with AI because AI satisf satisfies this monotonicity requirement, right? So, how do we do that? So we look for all AMs that satisfies this property, say this is this, and maybe this, and so forth. And among all of these uh, uh, elements, we find the element for which its optimal solution, so the longest increasing sequence ending with this element, is uh, the longest. If there are ties, it doesn't matter how you break them. So we look at all subsequences that end with that particular sequence, oh sorry, with that particular element, and amongst all of such optimal solutions, we pick the best, the longest one, and extend it with AI. Why does this produce a correct solution to the uh, problem PI? Well, again, the very same argument, uh, right? Simply consider the optimal solution that ends with AI uh, and say this is uh, A, um, say K1, then A, K2, up to A, K, M, where K, M, of course, is equal to I because we want a sequence that ends up uh, with uh, I. And say, so the previous element is A K M minus one. So again, my claim is that if I take this optimal solution and delete the very last element, what I get, the remainder will be optimal solution for the problem of finding longest length subsequence that ends with element K M minus one. Why is this so? Why does this, why the, does this truncation have to be uh, optimal solution for the problem K M minus one? How do you argue? Cut and paste, come on. My gosh, I mean, what's the problem? <laughs> Look, so say, here is, uh, uh, maybe if I draw a nicer picture, you, it will be easier, eh? AK1, AK2, AK3, AK minus two, uh, sorry, AK, uh, uh, what did we use? M minus uh, two, AK, M minus one, and finally A K M, where uh, this is uh, where uh, K M is just the I because uh, we need, uh, so this is A I because we need solution for the problem uh, of finding longest increasing sequence which ends with A I. Well, I am claiming that if this is this optimal solution and I delete this guy, What's left is the optimal solution for A, K, M minus one. Namely, it's the longest sequence uh, in, that is increasing and ends with particular element K, M minus one. Why is this so? Well, assume it is not. So assume there is another sequence B, uh, B, um, uh, say, uh, B, S one, B S two all the way to B S uh, P say such that uh, uh, S P is uh, so that uh, sorry so that P is larger than M uh, uh, minus uh, one right so there is a longer sequence that can be that finishes with AKM. But then could this sequence be an optimal solution for AKM? No, because I can take simply AKM uh, con and concatenate it, concatenate it to BSP, 
and get an even uh, longer so, uh, subsequence that also ends uh, with KM, AKM. So, uh, so a subsequence of the optimal solution that ends with AI must be, and in fact, not only for the very last uh, before AI, but for all of them, any truncation up to certain element is optimal solution to the problem up to that element. So, um, and of course now we proceed exactly as in the previous example. Uh, we construct, we solve all subproblems PI and among all solutions we choose one that is uh, the longest. Let's look at the, um, so this is what we just explained. Let's do again the problem making change, right? And okay, so the thing is, that's a good question. We, we add this extra condition that we are looking for optimal solution that ends with AI because the solution is then recursion is simple. Why? In order, you see, if I didn't have the, uh, the, the, uh, the requirement that the sequence ends with AI, uh, then I wouldn't know what is the end point of the optimal solution up to AI because maybe it finishes somewhere inside here. And I wouldn't know then how to construct it from previous sequences uh, because I don't know what's the ending point. Now, if you enforce uh, that the sequence has to end with AI, uh, then the condition what can be extended with AI is very simple. You simply look for all numbers smaller de than AI because only if this uh, number is smaller than AI, optimal solution that ends with AM can be extended with AI. So it dramatically restricts the search space because in order to find optimal solution for AI, I know because it has to end with AI, I simply have to look for the previous element smaller than AI, choose optimal the best optimal solution among them and extend it with AI. Otherwise, if I don't force that uh, the solution has to ex uh, end with AI, I don't know uh, what, uh, uh, you know, how to choose, uh, the, how to do the recursion. Right? This re uh, dramatically reduces the complexity of the, allows simple recursion. And it is non-restrictive. Why it is non-restrictive? So assume that we solved all the problems. So for every i, we found the longest increasing sequence that ends with solution, with the, ends with the number ai. I claim among these uh, solutions, the, 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 the global optimum, namely the longest increasing sequence uh, built out, uh, that is subsequence of this uh, sequence, must be present there. Why? Well, take the optimal solution built out of all elements A1 up to AN. This optimal solution must end with some element AM, say. Well, but that solution was built when we constructed optimal solution that ends with element AM. So the co extra condition allows simple recursion, but it doesn't cause us to miss um, any optimal solutions, right? <coughs> Sometimes you do miss some solutions, but not all of them because there can be several optimal solutions, right? For example, here there might be several, several increasing sequences of the longest possible length. Maybe if the longest length is 17, there is one sequence with 17 elements and another sequence also increasing with 17 elements. So in general, we might lose 
some of the solutions, but not all of them. And from whatever is left, we will be able to pick a optimal solution for the whole problem. This is probably even better exemplified in this uh, making change uh, problem. So on the final, you will have at least two dynamic programming problems. And you know, if you are taking this course, uh, then this is the most powerful technique that uh, we will cover. So it's really the crux of the course. So please uh, do, I'll, I'll, I'll assign homework um, and try to do as many as you can, as many problems as you can to practice because you have to get a gut feeling how to generalize the problem. As, as you will see as we progress, <coughs> sometimes it is not easy at all to see what should be the sub-problems, how to generalize them in such a way that they allow easy recursion and you don't miss any of, uh, you don't miss uh, uh, optimal solution. Okay, so you are given n denominations of coins uh, and certain amount uh, C. Your task is to give the change for the amount C using as few coins as possible, okay? So let us, before we describe the recursion, let us just think about the structure of this problem. So, okay, so what we are going to do, we are going to solve the following, uh, the whole bunch of uh, Problem. So this is this generalization. Uh, you generalize the problem to allow a simple recursion. So what is the generalization? You will, for every amount, small c, that is smaller than the amount or equal the amount that you want to return, you will find the optimal solution for the amount small c, namely combination of coins that add up to C and there are as few coins as possible, right? How do we do that, huh? okay? So assume that we solved this problem and build a table of optimal solutions all the way up to amount C minus one. Here is C minus two and so forth. And now we want to solve this uh, for amount C, okay? How do we do that? Huh? Well, let's look at the optimal solution. Assume that this is the optimal solution with some coins, right? They end up, uh, they sum up to, uh, so some of them is equal to the amount C. Now, take any of these coins, uh, right? Say its value is uh, Vm, okay? And throw it out, right? Throw it out. So my claim is that what is left uh, is optimal solution for small c minus Vm. Why is this so? Why, if I throw the coin of value Vm, one coin, and it's a value Vm, why do I have to, why the remainder has to be optimal solution for the value C minus Vm? Well, assume opposite. It's the same trick, cut and paste. Assume the opposite. Assume that there is something better. So here we use one, two, three, four, five, Assume that there is a solution with only four coins for also for the amount C minus Vm. How do I derive a contradiction now? Yes. Exactly, so if, you, if this was really a better solution using fewer coins, 
to get value C minus Vm. If I add the coin Vm, so if I add it here, then this solution, this combination plus coin Vm would be so optimal solution for C that is better than that solution. But I had assumed that this is optimal solution for the amount C. Right? So if I remove this, leftover must be optimal solution for C minus Vm because if it were not, if there was a better solution for the amount C minus Vm, I could add Vm to this and get a better solution than this solution for the amount C. So if I remove one coin, I get optimal solution for this A problem. But what is now the problem? Why can't I just say, well, pick any VM, take uh, V1, for example, or take uh, V5, uh, and just find optimal solution for C minus V5? Why I cannot do that? <coughs> Sorry? Because... Uh, um, but it doesn't matter, we just argued, it doesn't matter what Vm is. For as long as it's a coin from the optimal solution, when I remove it, what I get must be optimal solution for C minus Vm. So I could simply find the solution for C minus Vm and add Vm. Exactly. You don't know what coins are involved in the optimal solution for C. <coughs> right? Maybe C does not involve Vm. Maybe it involves just one type of coins. It just happens, right? So how do we solve that problem? We recurse. We look at all possible amounts C minus Vm when M ranges between 1 and N. Right? And we find in our table optimal solution for all of these amounts. And we pick one that involves fewest number of coins. And we extend that one. Why? Well, we know whatever is optimal solution, it has to contain at least one type of the coins. Removing it, it will produce optimal solution for this amount, right? So if I arrange with Vm through all possible po coins and look for optimal solutions for these amounts, the optimal solution for C must be here because it has to involve at least one type of the coins. So among all optimal solutions for all amounts C minus Vm, right? For all optimal solutions for this amount C minus Vm, if I pick one that uses fewest coins, well, of course, that must be the optimal solution for um, uh, amount C when extended with this extra coin, right? So you see, uh, uh, this argument I didn't want to show you last time because I wanted first to show you how the recursion works, but uh, this is a crucial part because you have to verify that you have this sub optimal sub-problem, optimal solution sub-problem property because only then you can build optimal solutions for, um, for larger problems from optimal solutions from smaller problems, okay? Uh, are you with me with, uh, with this? Any, any questions, please? Yes. Yes. So the, the, the list of all the nominations is uh, uh, V1, which we assume is 1 so that we are guaranteed that any amount can be given. Then uh, V2. Somewhere here is our Vm all the way up to Vn. So we have n denominations and we search through all possible solutions for sub-problems where Vm ranges through this set. 
right? And for among all the solutions, we find the one that contains fewest number of coins and extend it with VM. Any other questions? Yes. So how do you get through the kind of the value? Because you can't just send the request and say, hey, can you give me an action called uh, that string of coins to one VI? Uh, no. You see, that's because, uh, yeah, this, the, in this problem, we don't have this. Uh, extra, because you see, recursion doesn't go through this. Uh, the recursion goes through the amounts, right? Uh, so we don't make any assumptions which coin um, has to be involved. For that reason, we have to do exhaustive search through all possible denominations, but notice, this is exhaustive search only for the induction case, for the recursion case, and the whole solution is not exhaustive search because we build it always from previously built uh, uh, solutions. Any other questions? Please be, don't be shy. This, it's a tricky uh, subject, so don't be shy and uh, ask me questions if you have any. Okay, so you are all happy? Okay, so this is making change. Uh, let us uh, now um, solve the integer knapsack problem with du uh, duplicate items allowed. So what is the problem? So, okay, let's make it less dry than what is uh, here. So you broke into, you are a burglar and you broke into a department store, right? And you have a knapsack, right? That can hold only certain amount of weight. And uh, you, uh, you broke into, actually into a, um, warehouse so, so there are there is almost unlimited amount of items uh, uh, copies of the same item right so what you want to do is uh, fill your backpack in such a way that the total value of all items is as large as possible but the total weight of items does not exceed the capacity of the knapsack, right? So just imagine. Now let's first see why this is a tricky problem. You know, uh, say, uh, say these are your items of type one and you have huge number of them, more than what you can put in your uh, knapsack. And here you have another type. Each of these items is the same weight, uh, v, uh, weight one and the value V1. All of these are weight two and weight value V2 and say there are altogether n such types of items with weight, last one with weight Wn and value Vn, and you have your knapsack of capacity C. And you have to make the following choice. Maybe you will take three of these items, five of these items, six of these items, so that you fill the knapsack so that you don't exceed the capacity, but some total of values of all items in your knapsack is uh, as large as possible, okay? So if you try to do it greedy way, what would you, which items would you choose? Uh, no, C is the sum total weight, very good. So double, sum W and uh, K uh, over all 
and k has to be smaller than c. And you want to maximize uh, uh, sum over n k of v n k. Yeah? So, uh, one would be tempted to use greedy. If you were to try to solve this problem, oh, okay, so assume that these are not discrete items, uh, but they are some powders. Uh. Don't ask me what kind of powder, okay? <laughs> so, if this is kind of continuously divisible, uh, okay, uh, how would you fill the knapsack? Which powder would you choose? So say you have specific weight, it's uh, uh, five uh, grams per cubic centimeter, and the value is a uh, hundred dollars per cubic centimeter. So how would you fill your knapsack? The largest value exactly. You would pick the largest one with the largest value per unit of weight. And so you would first exhaust uh, all of the supply, right, of uh, uh, this item. Then you would move for the with the next largest ratio of uh, uh, V over W, right, and so forth. And it's easy to see that this is an optimal solution. But you see, it's... Uh, it should be easy to cook up a problem when greedy, when the objects are discrete, is not the optimal solution because, say, you have three items um, and your bag, C, uh, holds 100 kilograms and uh, this is... Uh, say, uh, uh, da, 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 let me see, 80 kilograms, this is 60 kilograms, and this is 20 kilograms, uh, and the, the, the value is, uh, say, uh, uh, this one, uh, I should have uh, looked up the numbers, but you can cook up the values uh, here um, so that uh, this is the most valuable, say it is, uh, uh, it is 10 over 60, uh, this one is less valuable because it's 20 over 130 and this one is even less valuable because uh, it is, uh, uh, sorry, it's the other way around. It is, uh, uh, so it is 20 kilogram weight. And I'll, uh, I'll, I'll look up the numbers. I don't remember, but you see the point is uh, that, um, was it? Uh, Uh, no, 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 let's have this is 40, this is 60, this is 80, and the uh, most valuable is actually this one. So the value per weight here is the largest, but if you take this one, it's 80 kilos, and neither of these can be placed, where both of these uh, are smaller value <coughs> per kilogram than this one, uh, but uh, you can fill uh, the knapsack in a better way. It's easy to produce the values. So take here that the value is simply, say, uh, one uh, per uh, kilogram, and here the value is, say, 0.9 per kilogram, and here the value is 0.8 per uh, kilogram, right? Now it's easy to see that if you take the one with the largest value per kilogram, you have left out space of only uh, 20 kilos and you cannot put uh, either of these two objects. But if you take these two objects, even though the specific value is smaller, you can fill more completely the knapsack and uh, 
uh, you get a better value in this way. So you see, doing it greedy way will not work. Okay, so uh, let's make a short break and you think during the break how to, how would you do this? Uh, it's very similar to the change problem.
Okay, people, let us continue with dynamic programming. So, knapsack, integer knapsack problem when duplicate items are allowed. So, you are assuming that you have unlimited supply of objects of each of the n different kinds, okay? And you have to decide how many of these you should choose, how many of these, how many of these to fill the knapsack of capacity C. And uh, as kind of tempting as it looks to try to be clever about uh, the combinations in some greedy way, uh, greedy actually uh, does not uh, work. So how do we solve this problem? We solve this problem by uh, again by recursion uh, for, uh, on all capacities small c that are smaller than the capital C. So your table will be very long Right, your table will be very long because here is one kilogram knapsack, two kilogram knapsack, all the way maybe up to 100 kilograms here and uh, maybe 200 kilograms the total capacity. So if you have, so we now want to fill a knapsack of capacity small c, assuming that we know how to fill all knapsacks of smaller capacity, right? So the table has been filled from the beginning up to C minus one. We assume that the values, uh, that the weights uh, are integer, right? How would you choose uh, how to fill the knapsack of capacity C if you know how to fill all smaller capacity knapsacks. It's very similar to what we did with the coins. Any suggestions? Uh, yes. Uh, Sorry? Exactly. So you do exhaustive search, but only an on the recursion uh, step. You simply say, okay, let me try to fill my knapsack, right? First, I'll throw in one object of type one. The leftover space will be, let's erase uh, the past stuff. So you simply say, okay, let me try C minus weight W1, because if I throw in an object of, of, of weight W1, this will be the remaining capacity. But for this capacity, I know optimal solution is ready here. So I'll look at opt uh, C minus V1. And to get optimal solution, well, to get a candidate for optimal solution, what do I add to this quantity? So I throw into my knapsack object, one object of type one. Leftover space is C minus W1. Optimal solution, what I can stuff with into knapsack of this capacity is this. Well, if I do throw in object uh, uh, one, what will be the value of uh, that solution for the value C? Plus V1. Exactly, plus V1. Then I try C minus W2. I find opt C minus W2 plus V2. All the way I try C minus WN. I look in the table what is opt C minus WN plus VN. And then from this set, what do I take? 
among all these options, which one do I, which one do I take? The largest. the largest. So take max of these, and this will be optimal solution for the capacity C. Why am I guaranteed that this is indeed the optimal solution for capacity C? Well, whatever optimal solution for capacity C is, uh, it has to contain at least one kind of the object, uh, object, right? If I remove that one kind of the objects, I will be in one of these cases. I don't know in which one. But if I remove uh, from my optimal solution uh, one object, the, I must be left with this by the same cut and paste argument, right? So because optimal solution, you see, if I, it's the same story. If I remove one object, the, what is left is optimal solution for the, this smaller capacity. Because if there was something better, I could extend it with the object removed and get something better for C. So. My optimal solution for C must be here, and if I choose max of this, of course, you will hit precisely that optimal solution. Is this clear? Now, is this a feasible solution? Unfortunately, it is not. Why is the case? Why is this the case? Um, Say you have only two types of objects. Uh, one is one kilo. Um, the other is uh, two kilos, which is one zero in binary, right? And the capacity is uh, one zero zero. Uh, how many, say, uh, if this is... Um, Nine zeros, uh, what is uh, 2 to the 10 is 1,024, right? So assume that this is, that C is 1,024 kilograms. So the length of my solution is 1,024. But the length of the formulation of the problem is 1, 2, 3, well, let's count the spaces, uh, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, all together how many, ten, thirteen, fifteen bits only. So the length of the input, uh, if you encode this into your computer, will be only fifteen bits, but the length of recursion is 1024. And that's exponential in the number 15, right? Because capacity of the knapsack is written using only log many of C bits. Log too many bits of C. And so this is not a feasible solution. But guess what? That's the best what we have. And in all likelihood, unless something totally, totally weird happens, something called P equals NP, which we will discuss by the end of the course, which no one believes that it is the case, but no one can prove it is not. Um, the knapsack cannot have feasible solution because it's uh, what's called an NP complete uh, problem. So this is, uh, so here is the description of the algorithm that we just did on the board. Um, um, so after C many steps, I will obtain op C, which is what we needed. Okay. Now assume that uh, you did not break into a uh, warehouse, but in a little corner shop in which you have only a few items, finite, finite uh, limited, small number of items of each kind. Well, that's the same as saying uh, you have finitely many objects, some of which can be of the same type. Uh, 
but not necessarily, right? So now we are not bounding the, the number of uh, kinds of objects, but the number of objects themselves. And that's a very interesting variation because it introduces uh, for the first time two-dimensional recursion, a 2D recursion. Notice here the recursion so far always was linear. It, you could, the table consisted simply, uh, it was an array of the values. Uh, uh, all the sub-problems were linearly ordered. Uh, now we will have a case when the problems are not linearly ordered, but, um, well, they are not, they are, uh, the ordering comes sort of uh, from a 2D uh, structure. It, it is essentially, can be linearized again, but uh, uh, the natural way to see it uh, is uh, um, to look, think about this in two-dimensional space. Uh, Okay, so let's see how we solve this problem. Now, the recursion will be a double recursion. We will recurse both with respect to I and with respect to C. Okay, so um, the sub-problems will be indexed, will be will form a two-dimensional grid, right? And uh, so the problem um, that we might call PIC is the following. Choose from items, from the first I items, uh, a subset which fits in a knapsack of capacity C and is of the largest possible value. So now we have the parameter. What is the subset of items that uh, you can take? And uh, um, what is the capacity of the, uh, of the knapsack, right? So we will solve these problems for all j less than, I mean, we assume that we solve the problems for all j smaller than i, and all knapsack from capacities uh, from 1 to C, and for this particular I, we solve the problem for all capacities D less than C. It will be much easier when we look at the picture. So this is, so the natural representation is two-dimensional grid, okay? Even though the ordering is actually linear, but it's, uh, um, it's essentially like graphic <coughs> ordering. So, the instances in this cell, okay, we will store optimal solution of the following problem. Among first I items, uh, choose those that fit the best in a knapsack of capacity C. Okay, so the natural representation is uh, two-dimensional, we vary which, num which items we can choose, from which items we can choose, and we also vary the size of the knapsack, right? But actually the ordering is linear, it's lexicographical, because we fill the table filling row after row. So um, it's le lexicographical first with respect to i. Anything that has smaller index i, is smaller than this guy. If the index is equal to i, then uh, it is smaller if uh, d, what we say, is uh, smaller than the capacity c. So the ordering is essentially linear, but the representation is two-dimensional, right? Do you understand what this table is? Uh? So you have a bunch of objects. Uh, you order them in any way you want, so they are objects I1, I2, up to object uh, I, uh, N, And you have a knapsack of capacity C. Instead of that, 
you replace it with the C many knapsack of each smaller capacity, small c smaller than c, right? And you solve the problem, choose among first i items, optimal combination that optimally fits the knapsack c in the sense that the sum total value of all chosen uh, uh, items is as large as possible, but the, their weight does not exceed uh, the capacity of the knapsack. Huh? So assume now that you fill the, the greens. Okay, what, is, uh, what interests us is only this number here because we want to see optimal solution if we can use all of the n objects and the capacity of the knapsack is full uh, capacity capital C. So that's the only cell that we really are interested in. But in order to allow a recursive solution, right, we have to solve n times C many sub problems. And that sounds to, uh, as a large number of problems. We made our life more, really quite more complicated but there isn't simply a better solution, right? So you take whatever <coughs> you can get. Okay, so assume that we fill the table, all the green cells are filled, and now we want to fill the blue cell. What is the sub-problem for the blue cell? The problem is uh, among all objects between one to i, fill optimally a knapsack of capacity small c. How do we do that? Now careful, uh, each element can be taken only once. Either you take it or you leave it. So how would you fill the knapsack? What would you do? What are your options? Yes. That's a tricky one, right? You don't know what to add. So, but look, we are assuming that the available objects are only between one and i. So the i objects you either take or you don't take. Well, these are your only options. So first you will look at the best possible solution if you do not take that object. If you do not take that object, it means you are filling your knapsack only with elements from 1 to i minus 1. Since you didn't take the object, you have full capacity of the knapsack, small c. So where is the solution that you are extending by not taking object uh, i? Where is the solution that you are uh, extending? The, which solution would you put here? tentative solution exactly the cell above because the cell above has exactly the same capacity knapsack but it uses only elements up to i minus one so that's the first option the second option is you do take an it item if you do take the it item which cell are you looking at Hmm? Which cell are you uh, looking? If you take the i object, say its weight is wi, how much space have you got left in your knapsack? <laughs> C minus wi. Well, you look at opt of C minus WI, what do you add to that? Which object, uh, besides the optimal solution for this, which objects also you took? So you say, take the knapsack and put the object I inside. The remaining space is C minus WI, See what objects you can optimally stuff the remaining space. 
And what do you get at the end? Plus vi, of course, because you took the object i. So now you simply take max of opt, um, uh, opt i minus 1 c and uh, opt uh, c minus, oops, uh, I'm changing the ordering. So opt, how do I write? Uh, um, uh, so this is, uh, um, so opt for the object here, it will be, sorry. So opt of, uh, uh, so here we took uh, uh, objects only up to i minus uh, uh, one. What am I doing? Sorry, I'm messing it up. <laughs> Let me write it for I knew. So first option is we do not take the object. So th the solution will, will then be opt of just objects among i minus one for the full capacity C. The second, if I do take the object, so I'll have opt at of i but C minus W, um, w I plus V I, and then I take the max of the two, the largest of the two, and uh, this is my optimal solution for the cell, right? So two options. If I don't take the i object, all the objects are among 1 to i minus 1. Since I didn't take the object, my uh, the knapsack is empty. Full capacity C is here. So this is the solution, previous solution here. If I do take the i object, right, then I have to look what can I uh, uh, get from, so here it is also, we can also put, i minus 1 because we took object i. So we look among first i minus 1 objects, but now the capacity is only c minus wi. So on c minus wi, I have to add the value of the object that I took, right, uh, which is uh, vi. And if vi plus the solution here, is better than the solution here, I, get, I will uh, take this, otherwise I take the other one. So here it is, if opt i minus one, c minus w plus vi, if this is better than opt i minus one c, then we take that solution. Otherwise, we take opt as optimal solution, just the solution here, which is just uh, opt i minus one c. Right? And of course, final solution, optimal solution, will be the one that sits in the right hand side most corner. So you see, because we had to make decisions, you see, in the previous example with the, um, with the knapsack that did not involve. Uh, um, that did not involve uh, two-dimensional recursion. So when duplicate items were allowed, where did I use the assumption that uh, the supply of objects of each kind is unlimited? So where did I use the assumption that I can take as many objects of the same kind uh, as uh, I want? Okay, so you remember how we did it. We said you simply take max of um, C minus W, max of opt C minus W1 
plus w1, then opt c minus w2 plus v2, all the way to opt c minus wn plus vn. So uh, this was, this max was our opt of uh, c. Where did I use uh, in this recursion assumption that the supply of each types of objects is unlimited? What do you think? Why do I need to assume that each object is available in as many copies as I want? I s exactly. You see, the point is this. For this recursion to be valid, because I am scanning through all possible options for this item to be picked, I must assume that I have as many copies of each as possible. Because, say, if uh, uh, I had only one object, uh, of type one, well, then this wouldn't be correct because maybe that object is already used in the optimal solution for C minus W1. So it won't be available at the next stage of recursion, right? If I don't have unlimited supply of objects of each kind, the recursion is no longer valid because maybe previous optimal solution exhausted uh, some, some of the types of the objects. So for this to be valid, we have to assume that uh, we have as many objects of each kind as we wish. <coughs> <coughs> this is the reason why in this problem, uh, the, the solution was more complex. We needed kind of two-dimensional recursion because we had to control whether we pick it object or not because if you pick that object, you cannot pick it again, right? Because here in optimal solutions, you see we distinguish only two cases. Either you pick that object and if you do, then for the rest, you have to pick only among objects up to i minus 1, right? So if you pick the object, for the remainder, you are allowed to go only up to object i minus 1 because there is only one object of type i. Okay, is it clear? This is really pretty tricky stuff and uh, you have to go very carefully through the uh, solutions in the notes. Um, and I would urge you also to look at the textbook. Uh, it gives a whole bunch of uh, dynamic programming problems and exercises because uh, it takes quite a while before you get hold of dynamic programming. And sometimes it's really hard to see how to, uh, how to generalize the problem, what the sub-problems should be, because you have to ensure that the sub-problems lock in a, a reasonably simple recursive relationship. And sometimes this is really not easy to see. In fact, at the end of these lecture notes, there is my favorite problem with stacking turtles uh, that is pretty, my uh, students find it really devilishly hard. Um, and I gave you a small hint um, how to approach it. So the point is, it's really tricky material, so Please uh, read the notes carefully. When you understand the algorithm, take a piece of paper and a pencil and re 
formulate your algorithm, write down the recursion uh, from scratch to make sure that you got the, uh, the idea behind it. Huh? Okay, here is a very nice problem. It's called balanced partition, and uh, it is also intractable. So the solution will be in exponential time. And the problem sounds incredibly simple, but it's far from being simple. Uh, you have a bunch of numbers. You have to partition this set. So assume again, uh, I don't know what you will think about me, but uh, assume that you and your body uh, have robbed something. And uh, you have all the prices of all items that you got. Now you have to split the loot in such a way that the difference between the two halves is as small as possible, right? So to split it in an, in an as fair way as possible, how would you solve this problem? Uh, a hint is uh, think about the knapsack problem. Any ideas? Well, yeah, so you, yeah, so maybe if there are two equal objects, you would think maybe you should split it one you, one for you, one for me, but maybe say the, all the objects are one, one, and two. Value one, one, and two. So then one gets two objects of type one and but you are kind of getting there so in order to for each number you can only get that from that from that to that number well that's uh how would you can sort it? Uh, you can uh, sort them sure but uh you know it's Things can be all over the place, so sorting might not help you too much. You see, this is a beautiful example of reduction. And the idea is uh, simply uh, reduce it to the knapsack, compute the total value of the sum of all objects, sum of the values of all objects. Uh, call this quantity S. And then consider a knapsack of size S over 2. And I claim if you, when you solve a knapsack problem with these objects of, and the knapsack of size S over 2, you will solve the original problem. Why is this so? This is easy to see because, uh, um, so, Assume that optimal solution is uh, partitioning the two sets, I'm sorry, partitioning the set into two sets. One sum total is uh, S1, and the other is sum total is S2, right? So now, <coughs> let's compute this quantity. S over two, this is the capacity of our knapsack, right? S over 2 minus S1. So uh, say that S1 is smaller than S2. If you, um, if you use an knapsack to store objects whose, which sum up do, to S1, what is the leftover space? The leftover space is, well, this is S1 plus S2 divided by 2 minus S1. If you put this here on top of this 2, it gets doubled, so this becomes S2 minus S1. So what does this mean? It means that the difference between the two partitions, S2 and S1, is equal twice this quantity. But what is this quantity? This quantity is leftover space in your knapsack, right, when... Um, when the sum total is uh, uh, S1. So if you minimize uh, this quantity, if you stuff your knapsack as 
the best you can, then the difference between S2 and S1 uh, will be as small as possible, right? So just imagine objects that you have, declare both their weight and their value of each object is just the value, right? So the weight is equal to the value. Then solve the knapsack problem for the knapsack of capacity S1 plus S2 divided by two. What's the trick? Well, if you compute this, this difference, uh, you get that S1 plus S2 over two minus S1 is S2 minus S1 divided by two. So this gives you that the difference between the two halves uh, is twice the leftover space in the nap of the knapsack. So if you minimize this, you will automatically minimize that. But of course, minimizing this is maximizing S1 for as long as S1 is smaller than uh, the half, if, if, if it's the smaller, uh, the smaller uh, of the two halves. So, okay. So you know what, I'm bombarding you with too much stuff. Uh, it's probably, uh, in, my past, in my past experience, uh, this is the toughest of all possible, of all um, methods that we will cover. So let's stop here and you read 10 times this until it's clear in your head. Uh, so read it and then try to rehearse the whole algorithm in your head, paying attention to every detail. Uh.